Welcome to the March 21st, uh, 2018 meeting of the CPC. Happy spring, everybody. Doesn't feel like it, but it is. Um, as always, we begin with general public comment. This does not have to do with the specific proposals, but any general public comment. For folks. No? Uh, we have two sets of minutes to approve. The first is uh, November uh, 1st, and the second is November 6th. Is there a motion for the November 1st? So moved. A second? A second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, is there a motion for December 6th? Yes. A second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All right, that was quick. Uh, chair's report. Just a couple things. One is again a reminder on, Friday, on Saturday. Sorry, the at 11 o'clock is the first church um, uh, celebration for the reinstallation of the two windows. Uh, on a related note, and I think it was after our last meeting, didn't we catch the big editorial in the Gazette uh, in response to the church, to the church ruling? And it's interesting because the Gazette had come out with an editorial. I want to say months ago, stating how important it was to be, that's a CPC, be an avenue to fund churches, and now it seemed almost like about face, saying, whoa, wait a minute, given this court ruling, um, this may be something that we may never see again or do again. So mm -hmm. it was an interesting editorial if you have a chance to, to look at it. Um, so that, that is that. Um, moving right along, the request for contract wording change. Sarah? They, uh, that's, that was still on the agenda because that's the official one, but they changed it once. They, they will not be requesting a change. Okay. Well, we are moving quickly. We are an efficient committee. <laughs> the first four. So we're going to move right on to uh, meetings with applicants. Wayne is not here yet. I guess not Wayne. No, put my glasses on. So, uh, so we'll start off with the Academy of Music Project, and we're happy to have a uh, throwing up in the corner of the room <laughs> and as well. I have a um, turnout that is a synopsis of what we're asking for in an effort to kind of zero in on the historic components of our project. Because I know that before the previous application there was some confusion about what was historic, what wasn't. And I've already marked up, um, has looked at this previously, but I did add some stuff at the bottom. Hi, I'm Deborah Jansen, I'm the Executive Director at the Academy of Music, and I know it's customary to say where you live, and I do live in, I live and work in Northampton. I live on Roundhill Road, and I work on Main Street, and blessed. Um, I also want to thank the committee for rescheduling for tonight due to my illness last week. I was not able to make it. And thank you for uh, making the accommodation. Um, also, I'm just wanting to know, we, uh, Tom Douglas and myself went up before the uh, Northampton Store Commission uh, requesting a letter of support and wondering if uh, the committee had received it for this project. But we're going to vote in the committee about that. Okay. So you yeah. share that with us? You, you actually have this letter? No, um, I wasn't, since I was unwell, I was, wasn't at the last meeting. Um, so the Martha, answer is no, we do not have it. But Martha could maybe know the committee had any details for that discussion. Great. I think that in general, there was support for the project um, due to the historic importance of the building and the um, popularity to the public and the great public use of the building, which is evidenced um, in the application. And also, uh, I know that there were some revisions made from the last application, which I'm sure yes, you yes, talked as well, yes. so that was great. Um, so, and then, yes, an amendment was mailed into uh, Sarah LaValle. Um, the academy would, is going to um, do the repairs to the paint, do the painting and the flooring of the uh, wheelchair accessible bathroom upstairs, 
and Tom Douglas is going to be donating his services for the architectural drawings for the expanded bathrooms downstairs. So I don't know if you received that attachment as well. So, um, I wanted to share share with you, um, going along with the lines of, of um, the Academy's use, um, we serve nearly 60,000 um, patrons annually these days. 51% um, of those are from Northampton. We're able to collect uh, zip code data through ticket sales. So 17% um, come from outside the 50 mile radius and they provide about one hundred eighty, about $188,000 in total in tax revenues to the state and the city. It's about $130,000 to the state and $50,000, $53,000 to the city annually. Uh, the Academy of Music provides free rentals to such events as First Night, Kids Best Fest, JFK Band Concert, and other town events. We offer scholarships to our youth programs, comp tickets to numerous social service agencies and offer free his, uh, history tours. Um, over the course of uh, the past uh, 10 years, uh, the Academy has raised $545,000 towards historic preservation and um, theatrical equipment replacement and, and upgrades. Uh, the city of Northampton has contributed $482,000 the Community Preservation Fund has contributed 749785 and the state of Massachusetts 168921 But I do want to say prior to my tenure, the state had um, awarded the uh, Academy of Music $2 million in a, in a, through a bond bill uh, for the repointing of the, the brick and the new slate roof. Um, Tom Douglas is going to go over all of our um, project items with you. Yeah. Um, my name is Tom Douglas. I'm an architect in Northampton. And um, um, I just, this is a presentation that I gave to the Historic Commission a couple weeks ago, and um, Martha's seen it but I'll, I'll give it again to you guys um, because if you look at my handout, I tried to divide up, um, the, the information is divided into three parts. One is our request, which is the historic work that we're, um, we're, uh, we'd like to do and, and receive some funding uh, from you for. The second part, the second block, is what the Academy is going to do themselves, which Deborah just mentioned. And the third part is I tried to put together a list of um, all of the funding that the Academy has gotten since I've been involved with the Academy since about 2000. So um, I don't have exact numbers here in exact years, but these are these are relatively close to um, a synopsis of what we've gotten over the years. And, and the reason I um, listed those, those items and, and listed some of the things that um, the current projects that we're working on now is to put into perspective the amount of money we've gotten from outside sources that we, we certainly have never been, been able to fund all of our work through the CPC. Um, and we've gotten a lot of support through, through the Mass Cultural Council and through the state of Massachusetts and through um, a capital campaign that the, the Academy mounted before they did their interior reno renovation. Um, so, and then the ongoing projects we have now um, the historic part is just a piece of the overall project again because the city is uh, working on a new handicap accessible ramp on the exterior of the building and um, what else do they do and uh, we're going to be planning those basement bathroom expansions as well which I'll be donating services for. So the top part is the more pertinent part to um, what we'll talk about tonight which is just the historic preservation or rehabilitation parts that um, we'd like to pursue. This is a picture of the Academy before we started the um, last renovation of the interior. Um, it had paint from the 70s, the seats were from the 50s and the 70s, and Dwayne Robinson had kept it up on a shoestring for many, many years, so I'm sure you all have been in there since then. Um, some of the efforts that we went through to uh, 
choose new paint colors to the auditorium. We're uh, removing paint down to the original um, original paint and looking at the colors that uh, were used originally. Uh, this is one method that we use to determine the how we would move forward with the um, rehabilitation work. I can't say that this is preservation work that we um, we did, and David Drake from the store commission tried to hammer this home that we're not actually doing preservation work, we're doing historic rehabilitation work, and the difference is the, pre the exact preservation work that would be required would be well outside of the amount of money that we could raise to do this project. So we did the renovations previous to this um, really kind of on a shoestring compared to what ma most major restoration, theater restoration projects do. So this was um, the result of our last renovations, new seats, new paint, um, a lot of decorative painting, and there was a local painter who uh, really uh, stretched his budget and donated money to us and, and we did this, this amount of work on a really, really tight budget and a very small budget compared to, like I said, other big theater renovations where they have to raise $20 million to do something like this. So the reason I'm going over this is because this project was not really finished. We, we got like 95% done on this renovation project before we utterly ran out of money. Um, so some of the things that we still need to do is to, one of the things is replace the light fixtures in the theater. Um, you can see that the, most of the lights that are there now are these recessed cans that shine down in your eyes and that decorative painting ceiling, painted ceiling is uh, very rarely visible like this. It's a long uh, timed photograph. You really can't see a lot of the architecture in there that we went to so much trouble to, um, to highlight. So we'd like to, we have a lighting package that will shine and light the house, house um, ceiling and all the decorative stencils that we did. Um, we'd like to do some finish the stenciling that was uh, in those boxes. The boxes, we did some structural work to shore them up. We repainted them, but um, there's still some decorative stencils that we'd like to put inside of the box behind uh, where you would sit because it's such a focal point to the academy that as you're sitting in the audience looking up there. Um, one of the other things that I mentioned about lighting was you can see those little white spots on the ceiling. Those are electrical boxes that we wired in our rest in our renovation, but couldn't afford the lighting to uh, go there. So those were um, historically compatible pendants that we were planning to put there. And we got pricing for the whole um, package of lighting, but we weren't able to um, buy it at the time. And this is the lighting that I think is from the 70s, um, this kind of colonial fixture, which we'd like to replace. And we do have some original sconce fixtures and ceiling uh, mounted fixtures that we're trying to match as well as we can with something off the shelf. We can't have these custom made because it would cost a fortune to do. Um, but this is a good example of the $25 Home Depot light fixture that we bought after our um, last renovation. It does its job, it lights the building. <coughs> not particularly compatible to the building and we'd really love to buy the fixtures that we had picked that would finish the renovation of this um, auditorium. Um, that's one of the original fixtures. Um, it's got a little funny LED light stuck into it. They had some kind of shades, I think, originally. Those are all cast aluminum. We can't get those anymore. Um, but we can get things that are relatively close. This is that we would use in the auditorium that's got some cast aluminum parts and then those glass shades that are really, I think, pretty similar to what originally was there. Um, this is a sconce that's very similar to what, um, what the one example that we have that's there. And I'm just going over these things to try to show you, tell you to what, sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Why does it do this? <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't do anything. We're cursed with technology. I know. Usually this works for me. Um, but I can go on. I, I, I don't have a problem with the show. Uh, so we, we basically we'd like to finish the renovation that we started in the last um, project that we did. 
Um, the other parts of the project we'd like to do are the outer lobby, um, the outer lobby where the concession area is with the, the dome ceiling. It's all paint from the 70s, and it has some big 70s can lights that shine up on that dome ceiling. And um, we'd like to repaint in there, uh, relight it, take down the chandelier that um, is from the 70s as well, or 80s, I think. And then there's the outer lobby beyond that that is the one that you walk into as you um, enter the theater. We'd like to repaint that as well. Um, there's a salon that we're going to repaint, and then there's a basement um, hallway that leads you to the bathroom that we'd like to repaint. Um, so the process that we would go through for those projects is the same as what we would um, have done earlier in the, um, the auditorium restoration, which was uh, go through the different layers of paint, find out what was original, and um, see what level of stenciling or what types of colors they were, and then come up with a plan based on that investigation to, um, to come up with a compatible paint scheme. And the, the other thing that I included in your handout was a little, um, um, well, that's okay, Sarah, I can finish. Okay. Yeah. Oh. It's like it's <laughs> okay. But there's a um, uh, section from the Gazette and the Union News from when the Academy was first built and it first opened. Um, and so there, that's another method that we've used to uh, look for uh, what the original decorative scheme was inside of the Academy. So we have a number of different ways of looking for doing research for uh, what we'd like to bring back as a historic um, rehabilitation project. So, um, I think that, uh, and then the rest of this project is going to be funded by other sources, like I said, the uh, handicap ramp, and you know, some bathroom planning. And, uh, so I, I think that we're trying to limit our focus to purely historic rehabilitation of the building and finish the restoration we started and do the other parts that are connected to it so that the whole theater has a compatible look to it, or cohesive look actually, so that the whole theater is cohesive. And there are areas that are um, wildly out of date, wildly incompatible. So um, I know David Drake really did quiz us about exactly the methods we, we would use to determine what was original. And um, so I've not gone over that with you. But um, I assume that you guys might have some questions about how we might make this more historic, our research. Um, is this a time that you'd like to ask me questions? Or <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, questions for Tom or two? Uh, is there oh, sorry, a revised amount that, you're, that is being asked for? I don't know whether that's maybe get rather um, than I think the proposal is, is requesting it, um, about a hundred about a hundred thousand. But with the oh. that was the writ with with the changes that you discussed today, is there a reduction in the amount or are you still asking for the same amount as your the original? It's application? the same amount. Same amount. So it's ninety six and a half. Yeah, yes. So, that's so not. what were the elements that we took out? Why was that not uh, painting the bathroom upstairs. Oh, yeah, the okay. salon bathroom, we took that out. Um, there was never any sprinkler work in that. No, that no. And then, your, and then your services. So why would that not reduce the amount of the request? Um, it would reduce the amount, whatever that's in there as, as allotted for him. So there should be, in that packet, there should be numbers that had gone along with that. Okay. Yeah, there are. I don't have the so proposal with me. So there is a reduction in the yeah. amount of request. And that reduction would just be the eleven thousand for the um, bathroom. No, because that's repair, paint, inner lobby, salon, which is still part of it, right? Yes. So it's just really the painting the bathroom that yes. we're taking out. And um, number five. And the architectural drawings. Is out as well. Correct. So is that five and one on this? Like yes. Part of one. But the total on the page was Part. one through six. It's different from the total on the front page, right? Well, except that uh, five thousand is coming from other. Was it four thousand right. coming okay. from other sources? Okay. Okay. So it's still yeah. got it. So we're looking at taking nine thousand out, which is the architectural plans, correct? Correct. 
and then a little bit out for the painting of the Correct. bathroom. Right. Other than that, everything is in there. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So somewhere around ten thousand dollar reduction. Okay. Taking it down to that eighty six thousand. So Correct. That sounds right. Okay. Uh, other questions? This is something we ask pretty much everyone at this point in the year. Uh, if you could pick, this is probably for both of you. If you can pick some part of it that's more important than others. Uh, how would you prioritize? Well, I, I think if we could finish the previous time. project, that would be great. To buy the lighting, to finish the little bit of painting that we um, couldn't do, some of the decorative painting. So finish the auditorium restoration. So that, that that's outside of the work of the lobbies and the hallways. So I'm four. I was just say, is that number four on this list? That's actually number one on the complete the interior renovations of the auditorium. Oh, oh, and that's in my list. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The application. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Number one here. That would be number four. Number four. So we're prioritizing number four as number one. Okay. Thanks. Correct. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you have an existing relationship with the contractor to do this work? No, we have to go out to bid for it since it's a city on building. Yeah. So I have to put together the documents to go out to bid. So that's pretty much excluded from the amount we're asking for as well. Uh, other questions? Okay. So uh, I feel very fortunate in that I uh, am able to go to the Academy a lot and participate in all the wonderful programs. Um, when I sit there and eavesdrop, all I hear is really positive comments about the work that is done. I'm not convinced that there's a person in the audience that doesn't know that the work is completed. Mm -hmm. um, and I would know that. Right. Walking in, I think, oh my God, this is so beautiful, this is so great, all the work has been done. You know, the chandelier and the lobby is the original 1890, I'm sure, even though it's what, 1980? It's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I would never uh -huh. know yeah. any of that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I can see people coming up and saying you're spending another 100000 on what and why? Because yeah. it, it just looks so uh, complete. Yeah. And, and I don't know if there's a question there other than a, I can see people coming to me and saying, you know, it's done, why are you giving, why are you giving that? Well, I think the outer lobbies have are untouched from the 70s, so that is a brand new They're actually area. untouched from the 40s. Oh, okay. 40s. Oh, right, that paint paint is. The paint color scheme is from the uh, Clifford Boyd period. And that's the, the lobby. That's the lobby. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the outer lobbies. I guess one of the things that that I'd really like to see happen there is that we could provide lighting to all the arch architectural elements that we painted in a decorative way. So there's so much on the ceiling, people just never see it all because you look up and you see these bright recessed cans shining down in your face and there's so much detail you can't see. So we did all the wiring for that, all the infrastructure is in place, we just have to buy the fixtures. That's it. So yeah. I think, you know, I think part of it too is um, that there are, that the, there are many in the community that don't understand the history and the various connections of people that have gone through the Academy of Music. And uh, I know that over my past 10 years in, in being able to share that history with those that step through, um, whether it's a history tour, whether we put on blogs, to, to share, share that with the community is, you know, something that I look forward to. So I, I think that if we were to um, finish the project, I think that's something that we can talk about and sh and share with them and let people know that this is more in keeping with 1891 than some of the than the nipple lights that are under <laughs> under the um, overhang at this point. We, you know, as Andrew just said, we we have Home Depot lights and. Um, that's not. And there's also areas under the balcony. Sorry, I had a picture of it that I threw up, but 
the areas under the balcony where we had done the infrastructure for the new lighting that is really, really dark in there. Um, you just barely see anything under the balcony as you walk in, other than those cheapo lights that we bought. People are not able to sit in the uh, opera boxes because we don't have the rails back up. So, <laughs> um, sorry to bore down on the numbers, but we're in the usual position of if we were to fully fund your request, we'd be saying no to, to other requests. So. Um, that's why David's question about what's really a priority is important. So I'd like to refine that a little bit more. Um, you're now saying the auditorium lighting. Um, I wonder if you can pull out a figure for that and what is necessary to actually be able to use those boxes. I know the rails are necessary. Right. Is there anything else? And then is there a cost associated? Yeah. The for, stencils would be nice, but it's not for all. The, for I believe for the lighting, it's a little over forty thousand dollars, and the, the rails. I'm but that's imagining. a that's a price quote that is from two thousand thirteen. Yeah. So, so the, I, I would say the number four is the number. Much. Okay. So the, I wasn't sure what the carpet yeah. and seating were that are well, mentioned. Yeah, that's in the boxes, because right now there's this plywood floor in those upper boxes that you just asked about. So um, so if we had the rail, and then carpet on the floor, and then some seating, there is, they'd be There is no seating, or it's not? Uh, well, we have some folding chairs. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't okay. legal, you can't legally okay. seat people there because there are no railings, or can you? Uh, we Do could, <laughs> but the reason we um, ask people not to sit there is because I witnessed them sitting on the edge oh, and yeah. then putting their, and also putting their drinks on right. the edge as well. Or their so feet, right? it's behavior, you know, it's feet, right? Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? So, so just to follow up, that sounds like the stenciling portion of that I was a minor cost. That's a very minor cost, yeah. I could ask someone to do it for free maybe. <laughs> so you know, I know it's very tricky in an old building where you're constantly faced with compromises, you know, you know, to restore it completely to, you know, what it was like in you know, January eighteen ninety two is probably not gonna happen. Sorry. Um so, you know, I think we all appreciate that you put a lot of thought into this. Um, as you note, you know, this committee has given a lot of money to them. Uh, CPC over the years, not two million dollars, but you know, <laughs> some uh, some substantial amount. Yeah. And then you know we're hearing about um, you know other I think good changes that you plan to make. Mm -hmm. but, you, know, you all I can't see. Sorry. <laughs> but, but it's okay. um, in the future, I guess my question is more sort of broadly speaking: Is there a master plan? Is there like something that you think maybe two years down the road we want to do? You know, after the bathrooms downstairs, is there? A sort of document where you have all the things that you might want to do ever. There is. There is. And apologies <laughs> there if you shared that with the yeah, committee before. Yeah. yeah. I had some pictures of the next yeah. thing we wanted to do, but I, I don't. I can't get it up here. So. I mean, there are other things that we're working on um, beyond historic preservation, um, especially around the theater equipment. We're now having to replace 48 lighting instruments on on deck. Um, in addition, we we are hoping to get a sprinkler system put in the auditorium. Um, we have to replace a um, 1891 asbestos fire curtain, and eventually, once all of those are complete, then we like to reopen the upper lobby area, which has been walled off for with a projection, and so we have a second lobby area upstairs, and we can expose all this beautiful architecture that's up there as well, and have more usable space for. Do you have an order of magnitude cost for all these things? Um, well, we have um, estimates on the um, the lighting we don't. Right now we're working with National Grid to see if we can come up with a package uh, for LED lighting instruments. And so we're, we're in the midst of, of working on the that. Theatrical this, the theatrical lighting. The theatrical lighting, right, this week. Um, but it, that's approximately 100000 Then the, um, the sprinkler system is another um, 120000 and that's also the same with the fire curtain around that, that area. It sounds like the opening the lobby upstairs would be a big ticket, though. That's a big ticket, yeah. Yeah, that there's hard to product work that has to be rerouted and yeah. the plasters are really crumbling up there. 
That would require a capital campaign and a lot of effort. In the seven to eight years, probably. So. Well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. What about the basement? Is that, I've been down there just as people are prepping to go up on stage. Is that? The green room area? Yeah, is that something that? Um, well, what we've done down there is we've repainted. The Academy, you know, repainted themselves. Mm -hmm. um, we had, over the last two years, we've uh, rented some dumpsters and gotten rid of a lot of materials, tried to get as much fabric out of the basement as possible. Uh, purchased uh, uh, folding chairs for downstairs and some tables rather than having sofas, anything fabric so that it doesn't absorb the moisture downstairs. And that's just the extent that we've, we've gone to. The other, only other thing you can really do downstairs is paint the basement floor, mm -hmm. and resurface the, and seal the basement floor. Okay, but there are no plans to finish it? No, like no, no, no. Functions mm -hmm. pretty well now yeah. for the performers. Mm -hmm. Better than many places. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you so much. Sure. Well, we have come a long way in this trek since 2000 to Thanks, prepare okay. this building for me. It shows. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so moving right along, Wayne, thank you for coming. Uh, as you know, I imagine from what Sarah told you that you know, the $3,000 uh, sort of small grant proposal for the sign is up into the, uh, uh, into the sort of big cycle yep. because we have questions about it. Okay. Uh, so thank you for uh, choosing us for your Wednesday night. <laughs> uh, and maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about specifics is what we were looking for. Uh, where, uh, what, those kinds of things. Okay, we have some of the specifics we don't have at all. So I, I sort of can tell you what, what we know, which is um, one of your questions is where would signs go and sort of how are we allocating signs and what was the process. And what we want to do is have one sign for each of the large conservation areas. Well, all of those large conservation areas have multiple entrances. So we haven't figured out which makes most sense, and that's been based on our partnerships. We, you know, we have partners for each of these conservation areas. So Mineral Hills, which goes a long way, we want to put up one sign somewhere in Mineral Hills. Salma Hills, we want to do one. Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake, probably Connecticut River Greenway. Although it's an older sign there, definitely the Mill River Greenway, probably Beaver Brook. Um, so we're still working out those details. So there's, there's sort of seven large conservation. Actually, there's eight large conservation areas. So if we did one brief one, we'd, le we'd leave one out. Um, some like Mineral Hills are massive. So those are details we don't know. I mean, again, definitely one for Salmon Hills, one for Mineral Hills, and one for Broadbrook. Those are by far. And, and one can, for can I just interrupt? Yes. The thought of doing one for each, just a cost concern to? Yes. Right. So, so we were talking about that much money here. I mean, if we right. get three entrances, why not have three signs? Um, I'd like to move that. I think we're sort of testing at this point. Yeah. We were asking you for $2,900, which covers seven of these signs. Right. So, you know, and, and obviously we're taking advantage of the small grant ground. And we, more. you know, <laughs> yes, we have to do that. <laughs> so we, okay, you know, yeah, that's all we Go ahead, go yeah. ahead. Um, yeah, we do as many as we could. We're certainly designing them that could be replicated. So it's not like if we do this, then we're stuck. We could always add more mm -hmm. later in the process. We have, so one of the questions, so I'm going to come back to that in a second. One of the questions you had is what would the signs look like? So we don't know that, but we know we want to show look and feel. So there's sort of two look and feels out there. There's the, um, the lead civic and the work they, that they've done that you funded. Um, and then there's all the work, the signs we put along the bike path. This was not CPA money, we used different things. But we had an earlier version which we kept for about five years. They got a little bit scrapped. They, they worked really well for five years. We replaced them two years ago, a year ago, exactly, with new signs, the same sort of signs we want. And so we like the idea that then we don't want to do every time you go to a different area have a totally different thing looking. So we want some similarities, certainly in terms of materials, certainly in terms of mounting, um, and certainly in terms of colors that, that the pieces may be a little bit different for coming out there. But again, if it's going back to your question of that means it's scalable, right? Once we have a, a template, we can we can scale the template to, to any areas coming out there. The other thing is really so there's a cost of the signs, obviously, that we're asking you guys for. 
And then there's building the story for these areas. And some have very easy stories. You know, Mineral Hills, because of human history, has a great story. You know, we just we just closed about a month ago on a piece of land with your help, which included the, the Galena mine, the old lead mines. So that is a very rich human history. Um, some areas, there's you know, there's always a natural life history, but there's less human history that's out there. So we have having not sat down to write text for these yet. I don't know which ones will be at incredibly rich and exciting for so, so Wayne, the signs are not trail maps. The signs are not trail maps. So it's nothing to do with how to get from point A to point B. It's simply a historical or conservation look at the area. Right. Now, we will probably put on them, so when I talk about the bike path signs, they have a bigger map. That map covers 60% of the panel, roughly. We'll probably put out some sort of sign, but don't think of the trail map as much as an orientation map. You're here, we'll probably show a trail. If that was your only source of information, it might be confusing. So you know, imagine something that's 18 inches by 18 inches. If you, if you have an 18 inch by 18 inch sign for a thousand acre conservation areas, it could be a necessity, not incredibly detailed. But it'd be enough to know, oh, I could walk this trail and go from Turkey Road all the way to Chesterfield Road. Um, it's, does that make sense for that the big picture idea? Um, for instance, so, if you went to the Fitzgerald Lane, you would, you know, how to get to the, the boardwalk area, or I mean, would there be some of the basics of you know, it's going to be two miles to do that or anything like that? I, mean, I don't know. I mean, again, we haven't gotten that far. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we have along the, some areas is we do these sort of circles, what's the walking distance, um, which often helps people more than distance. And so we like that way of doing it. So we might say, you know, Joe makes a good example. If we did this anywhere right. farm road, we might say 20 minute walking to sure. fish right. out by dam. Um, but because it's going to be a relatively small piece of real estate, we, we're not going to give all the destinations. So I can imagine sort of what's the really exciting destination? The dam, if it's Joe Lake, the Vista at Roberts Hill or something like that. Um, part of the reason we're not more specific, well, besides that, not knowing if you're going to fund it, is we do want to do this in conjunction with our partners. So we might go to our partner, you know, at Mineral Hills, we have friends at Mineral Hills. They are primarily focused on Turkey Hill Road. They've expressed some interest in taking over the part of Mineral Hills which is on Chesterfield Road. Um, and we'd ask them, you know, tell us one destination that tells the story that's most important. So we, we sort of, we, I think you know that we see our role, the city's role, as preserving land, preserving resources, and empowering partners. We don't see ourselves as being the ones who build all the trails and do all those things. And so I, we're hoping this is one more method to get our partners engaged and excited about it. But obviously when we when we have a partner engaging in that means we're giving them some control in some of those decisions. And then the other question you asked was about the wayfinding piece. So it's not going to be like the wayfinding, you know, we're, we're about to embark on a major wayfinding campaign downtown. It's not going to be part of that, but it's again more similar to the wayfinding along the bike path. One of the questions we really play with is that distance thing. So I think your question is would we show distance on a trail? But of course, we, and this is going to be for some areas, we're always looking at changing people's mental maps, at getting them to understand how close the distance is. So I can certainly imagine where we have a conservation area with an easy walking distance of a neighborhood. We might flip, we might say, you know, Fitzgerald Lake's a bad example because North Farm Shore is not a great place to walk. But imagine it was. We might say 20 minute walk to Florence Center. So that the next time someone goes from Florence Center to Shell Lake, they might think about walking again. Bad example, because that's not a place I encourage people to walk, but there are other places closer to residential neighborhoods. So the wayfinding we use both to help people wayfind, not surprisingly, but also that the wayfinding signs we have now were all funded from public health money, Centers for Disease Control, and they were all ways how could we sneak in more exercise for people, you know. And so we, so we, to that element, we still want to use. Um, so I know that, um, for example, like in Fitzgerald, like there are existing signs at the trailheads, at yep. Cook Avenue and other is. Would those go? No, I don't want to get rid of those. And so again, we'd work. The show of Lake is the one where the most active partner. Broadbrook Coalition is more active than yeah. most of our other partners together. So we'd have to work with them in terms of what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And again, if they said they didn't want to sign there, we'd respect that, we've enough other sites to go. 
there's not really anywhere else where we have that level of signage where there's that potentially a conflict. And it, it could be one approach for Fitzgerald Lake is that would be more history and less the trail signage. And the other areas that don't have trail signage might have more. Who was it who came to ask us for money for a sign last year? Oh, Blake's leads. The leads group. Yeah. The leads group, right. For the space I'm written on. Yeah. I mean, first so of all, the, uh, I think that was three years ago. So those are up now. So these would, I think, are intended to have a similar type of looking field. There was this one last year. Was, I think last year was the lead, was the new conservation area. Right? I think it was last year. It's not, it's a sort of a historic walking tour. There, it's not conservation. Oh, the lead signs in downtown yeah. leads. Yeah. You're thinking about the conservation that's different from the ones in downtown leads, which are historic. You're right. right. And those are kind of like the ones also in downtown Florence, aren't they? Also, when they showed us the model. Kiosk. Yes. There was mm -hmm. like two sessions ago. Anyway, I'm just yeah. bringing up just sometimes these local group, you know, the individual groups could come to us as you say is maybe more there. This is more there if you've done the yeah. deal with the trails mm -hmm. and stuff. And, and I, I, mean, I personally am very happy to, to, to anything that gets that last extra, last last mile from preservation to actually used by people, which is great. Yeah. Um, so it would be great if the city would, you know, when 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 these local groups says I want to put a sign, say great, we have a template, we have sort of an overall strategy that not that they all have to be exactly the same, but you know, so that there is some consistency. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, and we're we're working on what is the trend is how do you get places more exciting? Mm -hmm. So friends of North Hampton Trails and Greenways, who's one of our partners, particularly for the bike paths, they're really trying to get art along the trail um, and think about how does that. They're both art events, you know, ephemeral activities to get people out, and bigger art installations. And so we're sort of always looking at how can we partner with different things. We we did a pilot program in Leeds before the project that you funded in Leeds, the bigger sign program. We did a pilot program of signs that are about a foot by foot that had just some, we, we also worked with Leeds Civic on this, right along the bike path in Leeds. So just sort of mini signs um, with, this, with the same kind of company, the same sort of vandal proof thing. They work. You know, we do find that signs along the road, we have very little vandalism problem. Signs deep in the woods, we're more careful about. You know, in terms of making big investments. So at this point, we're taking bigger signs than trail maps, but I can imagine some of the smaller signs as well. Do you see these as things people would see after they get out of their car? Or not, not, yes. not for people to see them while they're driving and say, oh, I'm going to stop it. Right, definitely after the car. Now, maybe colorful enough that, you know, right. someone pulls over, but they're, they're definitely going to be a bit. Pedestrian scale, not the car scale. Mm -hmm. But drawing attention to the area when you drive by. Exactly. Right. So we have some kind of sign itself, especially if there's snow on the ground or something, is what you need to know where the parking is. <laughs> yeah. I'm fascinated. I like history, but I'm not one of those people who stops at every historic marker. But there certainly are the people who sort of, yeah. all right, you know, so this, there may be some people pull in the parking lot and read the sign and go on to the next one, which is great. The, the amount of money you're asking for, Wayne, is just for the signs, not for any of the copy or uh, so who to either you're doing that or the, the, the uh, you know, BBC or other right. folks, is that right. correct? Right. So we have the graphic arts that we put together for the wayfinding signs that are on the bike path. We would sort of steal those files because then we, you know, we sort of have, I'm not a graphic person at all, I promise you I'm going to be doing the signs myself. But we have the files, the InDesign files, and so we can swap out one map and put in a different map. And we've worked already with Fossil, Fossil Industries, the company we use. We've worked with them already. We know we like their product. We know how to do it. So we can do that. We just see new text to drop in, new maps to drop in. So you're so going to use the template that was used for the like. That's correct. Right. Again, we may change the size of different elements once the right place, but yes. So when do you have a similar kind of template in mind for actual trail maps. I know there are some online. Some of them seem much better than others. I assume they've been done by the, the, the support partner. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that that would be a really important kind of sister. Yeah. We and don't. We have to ask. We're sort of trying to experiment. So there's a guy at UMass, Dave Litterer by name, I'll probably mispronounce his last name, who's done a lot of these sort of hand-drawn sketches. They're not totally accurate, mm -hmm. but they're very simple. He's done them for every conservation area. 
he loves doing them. If we buy a new piece of conservation art in 10 minutes, he's out there making this new sign. Um, and then we've done some work with GIS, much more accurate maps. And, I, and at some point, we want to do sort of a user survey and figure out what resonates more with people. We're not quite sure if we're doing that out there. Um, we have this, this CDC grant that I mentioned. This is the last year of it. We've, we've done, so Northampton is administering this money for 18 towns. We've done some walking maps in other towns and have played with using that. So that's one of the things we want to do is sort of figure out what, and, and you all can tell us, what, you know, look at our website, sort of computer maps and Dave's maps and tell us which one do you like better. Um, so I'd like to do a standard at some point for doing it. We were also, I don't know if it came to Sarah or somebody else, but there's an increasing number of people who are doing apps. And so, you know, who ask us to send them GIS maps and then they create the apps. Um, and we always cooperate with that when people want to do that. Um, and does one of those become so successful we just do links? I'm not sure, you know. Friends from Hampton Trails and Greenways, who mostly does bike paths. Oddly enough, I think they had a volunteer happen to do a trail map for Mineral Hills once. Um, so we're almost at the point of reality, we have lots of maps, we haven't quite figured out which one questions for Wayne? Howie, um, I think one of my concerns last week was that um, um, we were going to we were going to be seeing a series of requests for what was very similar work and and it was my preference if, if that was in fact the case to sort of bundle it all up and rather than, than do a piecemeal approach but it sounds to me that um, at least with regard to the, the major conservation areas, this this would really, I mean, more is better. But but this would really cover all the all the areas, all the major areas right now. But but is that accurate, or would you would you, um, I mean, what are the things the city feel needs to have this kind of identifying work done for it? So I, yes, I can imagine coming back for more signs. This covers the big conservation areas, but I, whoever said the comment about. If there's three inches of Sumitar Hills, why not three? Right. I guess I, I'm I'm a cautious person. I tend to like piloting things. Mm -hmm. So if this is a different pro you know, we did the, the first set on the bike path, which people loved, it was after five years, but five years wasn't as long a life as I would have liked. So I like the idea of sort of doing seven signs and learning our lessons and then expanding it later. So that's my preference. If you all said you wanted to give us more money, we do more signs, <laughs> we absolutely could, but you know, we're not desperate to move fast for doing it. Yeah. Um, I have a 20% person, or 50% person in my office who does conservation area maintenance. So he'd be the one who's actually still on the signs as part of our match, but it also just limits how much we can do in any, any one year as well. Does that answer? Yeah, sort of. I just, um, again, I think, I think my preference is to see a situation where we know how much of this we're going to be looking at yeah. over, over time. Um, I, you know, I, that's not a good reason not to do this now, but, I, but I, I'd like to have in the future a, a, a good feeling for um, how it fits into, and, I, and I, I take your point about, you know, let's see what works and, 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 and build on that. Um, uh, and we, I realize funding science now doesn't commit us to anything in the future, but, but I, it makes me feel more comfortable if I know how it fits into the, just right. the... The, whole, the, whole the other thing just to know that sort of may help a little bit is when we buy a conservation area, as part of our soft costs, we budget things and we do the overall package and go for grants. We do things we have to do immediately. You know, we have to put up a, a sign that names the area. We have to give credit to our funders. So one of the things is, yes, I can imagine coming back for a big program, but I could also imagine saying once we create a standard, Every time we buy a new conservation area above a certain size, we're just going to build in. You know, kind of five hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. I, I would love that. Yeah. If, we, if, if that was just like that, would be like this is part of the this right. is part of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I just mention one of the things, you Dale? Right. I'm going to come back and formally brief you on this later. But um, so I, I'm not retiring anytime soon. I, I love my work here, but I do sort of sign to think about legacy and what are the things that survive and, and, and efforts. And so we are soon going to be announcing a new relationship with Kestrel Land Trust. Kestrel's been a partner for us in some projects. Um, 
their fundraising, frankly, has not particularly has not helped us at all. They fundraise for projects elsewhere, and they've been more a um, uh, you know a, a case by case partner. We pay them for services for the partner. We're probably going to try to formalize that relationship, and the city will do less fundraising. Cats will do more fundraising, and Cats will commit to being an equity partner for some of our, our deals. So we won't be competing with them for fundraising, we're turning it over. And so the reason I mention this now is this fits the sign program as well. You know, sort of, because part of this, of course, is we're going to give Castro credit for this stuff. And so as we start doing these signs, it may just be a logo for Castro. We're going to start thinking about how do we improve their visibility. Um, it won't be everywhere we, where we deal with Mass Audubon, we're continuing to use Mass Audubon, we're deals with state, we're continuing to use the state. But that's sort of part of this as well as repositioning. Any large land acquisition efforts that we should know about? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> so um, there is a lot. I'm happy to share this one because we've gone to city council already. Um, the if any of you know the Willard's gravel pit off Burt's Pit yeah. Road? Yeah. Um, we this has not been signed yet, so this could all blow up my face. But we have a handshake agreement with the tri the Willards is some family dispute. So we have a handshake agreement with the, with the bankruptcy trustee or the, um, to buy, um, well, to buy 90 acres from him and then hopefully an additional 40 acres from people who are buying the gravel pit itself. Um, we would obviously not commit to anything, but we would certainly be coming before CPA for that. We're 99% certain that's gonna go through in terms of getting a signed option. So that's our, our biggest one. Um, we have two other land, large ones, which I, well, one isn't surprised we see the for sale sign. If you go down Boggy Meadow Road, there's 50 acres on Boggy Meadow Road, there's a big for sale sign. We've been negotiating to buy that. Um, other people have been no negotiating to buy it as well. We're hoping we get the 30 acres along Boggy Meadow, which lines up with our other purchases there, and the 20 acres that's further west, we assume somebody else is gonna get. And then we have a large one, in the Mineral Hills, we not don't have anything signed, which for about, I don't know, six years now, we've been exchanging email. You know, we're a willing buyer, he's a willing seller, but we haven't agreed on price. We at least, on, by email, agree on price. Uh, it's not the same thing as getting to a signed deal, but I'm hoping it's, and that's key because the Mineral Hills and Chesterfield Road and Mineral Hills and Turkey Hill Road, they're both called Mineral Hills as aspiration, we want to connect them. This is the gap between them, uh, 110 sorry. acres between them. Again, you know, all these things could fall through until they're signed. Um, and will the arrangement with Kestrel happen before these? Yes. Kestrel went to the, so Kestrel staff and I, um, with the mayor's blessing, worked out a draft MOU. It went to their board two weeks ago who approved it. Um, I think the only remaining thing is we have a few projects in process, so we have to negotiate whether those projects meet the old rules, which they would like, which means we pay them a fee for service, or the new rules, which means they have to fundraise. And if we do the, if we do the old rules, I have to do one last fundraising campaign to pay for it. But I, I, I can't imagine the deal falling through, it's details we have to work out. So I think we're signed within a month. Um, this is not a legal contract, this is a memorandum of agreement. Um, it sort of says here for the public. We are, the reason you're in a preview now, besides that is about to happen, is we've pledged to them to brief everybody. So if the you know, mayor's on board, I'm, I'll come back and brief you more formally once we're signed. We'll be going to city council. Um, because we, you know, we take seriously, so, so we kept, we do fundraising at different levels. This is maybe more detail than you want, but just quickly. We have some people who've pledged a lot of money over a lot of years, and we rely on those funds. When we come before you and say we're matching it, it's often based on that. So our memorandum says people who've contributed $10,000 or more to us, and we have a small staple of those, we're not giving up those lists to Castro. We're continuing to try to hit up those lists. But then we also do fundraising campaigns that are broader, that are parcel by parcel. Um, and that the city, you can guess we have ethical issues that nonprofits don't have. You know, if I just wrote letters to people who apply for permits, <laughs> that looks bad. So we do a formal process. We do things like a buying piece of land. We search every home over $500,000 within a walking distance. The value of the home is as a 
you know, surrogate for, for somebody having disposable income. And so we did that kind of fundraising campaign because it's clear we're not picking our people. I didn't necessarily know who is on the list when it goes out. That's the kind of fundraising I'm hoping we get out of that we turn over to cash flow for time. Um, so yes, absolutely, by the time we're back before you, by, by your fall round, when we're coming before you, we're around the side. Well, do you have any sense what the order of magnitude of the ask will be on this, just to prepare us? <laughs> um, so the wild card in these things always is what state grants are available. Mm -hmm. So the um, the property on Wheeler, again, this is public going to council, is two hundred thousand dollars. We're not all from CPA, you know. And the property in the Mineral Hills is about two twenty, I think. Um, we will apply for a land grant, and we will probably apply for, which we have often gotten most years, mm -hmm. and we will apply for a fish and wildlife, what's that called? Uh, wetlands Conservation Grant. Wetlands Conservation Grant. And our assessment is frankly based on who will score the best. You know, so, we're, um, and so we have to put that all, so we, we know what the, we know the dollars amount are, we haven't yet figured out. Boggy Meadow sounds like wetland yeah, conservation to me. <laughs> yeah. Boggy Meadow and, and Willard would both score well for wetlands conservation. Um, Sarah's debrief from when we weren't funded last time. We had two grants from three grants, and then they stopped. So we had three, I think three in a row, great successes, and they stopped funding us. Sarah, if we look at other grants, seems to think 100 acres is the magic. So they would like lots of wetlands, and they like us being 100 acres. Um, they, they like being 100 or more? 100 or more, right. It's very new. right. Um, land has sort of a different criteria. Land, you can get up to four hundred thousand dollars, and it's almost the same amount of work whether you're asking for a hundred thousand or four hundred thousand. So we tend to want to be the biggest piece because you know they pay sixty-four percent of that. Um, we didn't get funded last year for them. That's the first time I think in thirty years we haven't gotten funded from them. Um, and it's really that they have a point system. We didn't do well because they so. When the state had common wealth capital, which is a measure of sustainability, you got 40% of your score just from common cap common wealth capital. We were the top rated community. So we were almost, even for a lousy project, we were guaranteed funding. Then they got rid of that, and so our scores dropped dramatically. Yeah. They've now put back in something called housing choice. Each governor plays what they want. Housing choice is rewarding communities for creating housing, affordable housing, and we should do well. So we think we'll go back into the mm -hmm. upper tier. So again, more optimistic, but never really know. Yeah. Each governor is doing priorities. And um, mineral hills, is there, a, is there a price associated with that, or are you not? So that's one that's roughly 220,000. Yeah. Um, okay. That's the one that's a little more complicated. Um, sometimes we've had sellers who think their property is worth a lot more than we think it's worth. And so we tend to be fiscally conservative. So I won't pay for a, a appraisal that often is $5,000 until we have a signed deal, because we can come up with pretty good values. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done sometimes is, I think we're doing Mineral Hills, is we agree on a base price, but that price would rise if the appraisal is higher. I think my number's pretty good, I think it's gonna rise dramatically, but it means it's a little bit of unknown. Until we, get, we would know that by the time we'd apply for you guys in the fall. Other questions for Wayne? Yeah, I'm just As always, thank you. Thank you all for having me. All right, boy, I think this is, is this the first time ever that we've had public comment with no public? public? I actually uh, wanted to make some comments about one of the applications as a member of the historical commission. I don't know how to do this, so how do I do this, Sarah? <laughs> Just stay, I don't have to get yeah. up and go. Are you sure? I don't know. I don't know. No, that's. Okay. So put your glasses on. I'm going to have to because I have to read. <laughs> Um, so, uh, when we reviewed the application for the historical, com uh, historical preservation plan from the Historical Commission, um, uh, I, I came away from it uh, feeling like there were a lot of un unanswered questions, and there was some detail, I think, that needed to be provided. So I, I just wanted to do that for you, um, just to give you some background on it. I just have a few points that I think will help kind of clarify uh, why this is an important thing to be doing. Um, as Barbara had presented at the last uh, meeting, there was a preservation plan, a cre 
created 25 years ago. Uh, it's not something the Historical Commission operates with, and I think the Planning Office doesn't even have a copy of it. I, I'm not really sure where she got it. So it's not something that we work with. And um, regardless, these plans of this type are usually updated over 10 to 20 years, so it's 25 years old anyway. Um, so it would need to be updated. Because the, the, the nature of the community has changed and the preservation issues in the community have changed over that length of time. Um, so th th there are a lot of reasons why we need to do this. And my husband said to me, you, say, you need to say this in positive terms rather than <laughs> negative terms. <laughs> so I'm going to try to do this as positively as I can. Um, we're what we think will come out of this um, are several things, and these are just examples. Um, one is I think it will help us to understand what Northampton residents, people who live in the city and uh, work in the city, feel are the most important historic assets that we have. We don't really have a sense of that right now. We have a general idea, but we may be wrong. Um, we have no mechanism in place right now other than the demolition delay for um, saving historic buildings or protecting historic buildings from removal. And just to give you a sense of that, in the time I've been on the commission, I'm not sure how many years it's been, I think four or five, um, we've allowed uh, several <coughs> historic buildings to be removed. Um, uh, two of them are on the the college, the infirmary is one of them. They are also planning on taking Leonard Baskin's studio down. This is all uh, through the historical commission. Um, the last vernacular uh, cottage on Main Street in Florence, um, which was removed to make way for an extension to the Cumberland Farms. Um, one of the last in-town barns um, on South Street was removed to make way for a parking lot. Um, and then right now in front of us we have an application to take down the city's first social welfare, or welfare organization. It was the original Lathrop Home. Um, on South Street. It's pending before the commission right now. So demolition is becoming increasingly a problem and we really don't have tools in place to um, prevent that. Um, we also have no mechanism in place for providing incentives for property owners to save their historic structures or for first time home buyers to possibly buy a historic structure and hold on to it or re renovate it rather than tear it down. Um, we're hoping that the plan, too, will help us to, um, have more of a step-by-step -step plan for nominating historic districts. Um, the Pomeroy Terrace District, which is uh, pending National Register status now, took, I think, at least 10 years to get going, maybe longer. 15, 20, 30. something like that. 30? Okay. <laughs> so this is just not a great track of it. Um, we'd also would like this to um, be a way to look better at how preservation might be incorporated to, into the city's overall sustainability goals. So as you know, the city's master plan is a sustainability plan. And we think preservation can really be a big part of that. But um, right now, there's no mechanism for making it happen. Um, we also want to improve our relationships with Historic Northampton and the David, David Ruggles Center. And I'm sorry to admit, that up until the past few months, uh, the Historical Commission did not even realize that the preservation of the city's historic cemeteries was under our purview. So all of these things are things that are kind of need to be addressed by this. Um, just, you may know this, but just for your knowledge, uh, the two other areas of interest for the Community Preservation Committee, which are open space and recreation and housing, uh, those areas do have their own plans. So um, the open space and recreation plan is prepared by the planning office, but there was a recreational needs assessment that was prepared by an outside consultant to augment that. Um, the housing needs assessment was also prepared by an outside consultant. And then of course, this is, uh, the, historic, the Sustainable Northampton Master Plan um, was completed by outside consultant and uh, an update is um, in the works. So uh, just to talk a little bit about what this plan would, um, how this plan would be made, there's certainly, there's cert uh, three real main components of it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with it, with it, but when a plan like this is done, we need to find out three things. One is what you have, so get, take stock of what the historic assets are in the city and the status of them and also the status of any mechanisms that are out there for preserving them. 
Um, second of all, we need to know what we what we want. So that's working with the community to find out what people really think about the historic and cultural assets in the city. What are the most important ones? You know, we think about like tonight the academy was here. We all think of that as being a really important building, but is that a really important building? Is it something that in, um, the people living in the city now really value, or, or the future generations really value? We just don't really know that, so that would help us find that out. Um, the other thing about the engagement part is, in getting people's um, thoughts about it, is to try to bring in as many people into the process as possible. So trying to get people involved who don't normally participate in these things, and that takes a lot of expertise um, to do it. And then finally, how do we get there? So you know what you have, and you know what you want, and then the final piece of it is how do you get there? How do you um, enact the proper preservation me measures to um, do what you need to do? There was a question about um, whether this could be done in-house, and um, I think that there are pieces of it that could be done in-house. Um, the kinds of skills that we uh, will require for this, um, one is the ability to assess the existing inventory, and I do think that's something that the Historical Commission members could um, work with a consultant on. Um, the other, second one would be um, assessing uh, the city's preservation planning mechanisms and their consistency with the sustainability plan. So this is something that a, a professional planner really needs to be involved in. Um, the public engagement process is also something that has to be specifically tailored to this, and that also requires the expertise of a consultant. And then finally, identifying preservation strategies. You know, that's again something that would, a consultant with preservation planning knowledge would bring to this. So, um, in closing, I think that the two pieces that we could assist with would one would be the inventory. And two, um, I think that the public engagement process is something that probably could dovetail with the update to the city's sustainability plan. And so that um, we may be able to you know, work with the lower budget to make that happen. That's it. Great. Thank you, Martha. Um, I would suggest we withhold further discussion or questions for Martha or about the uh, preservation plan itself until we move on to else want to do a public comment so it is five after eight um, we really have uh, no other business other than to begin funding recommendations um, it says if time allows it's not snowing out do we want to go for <laughs> 55 minutes and see how it goes till nine uh, we have a meeting planned in two weeks where we will, which is our make, making our final recommendations, but what is the sense of folks? Do you want to give it a go now? Here we are. Let's do it. Let's do it? Okay. Can I ask that Sarah send the calendar out again? I got completed. Yes. I didn't know what it means. <laughs> well, glad you did. <laughs> so we have four projects. Uh, in front of us, uh, the gravestones, the historic plan, the uh, interpretive signage, and the Academy of Music. We have advanced, since we funded the two small grants already, we have 123,000 available for this round. If we tally up all of the projects and we reduce the Academy by about 10,000, right? So we're at about 87 plus 100, that's 287, plus 30, that's uh, three, uh, I'm sorry, that's um, uh, 317, is that right? Hold on, what am I doing? No, I, I think I'm there. Uh, two, 217, right? And then another three, two, I saw I'm getting about 220, 220,000 around, is that, does that make sense? About? Is that right? 100,000 for the uh, gravestones, 86 for uh, the Academy of Music, so that's 186. Three for the uh, signage, so that's 189. And 189 plus 30, what's that? Uh, 229. Two what? 219. 219. 219. 
So let's call it 220,000. So we have 123,000 available. We have $220,000. Do we have to subtract the coalition dues from that that we funded on? Mm -hmm. No, uh, that comes out of, so this, when you look at the financial report, that's only funding that's available for project allocations. Okay. Um, that will come out of the administrative account and expenses. Like the computer. Yeah. So that okay. will come out of. Um, okay. So the surplus of, of this fiscal year's administrative account will go into next year's uh, project budgets. Is there any news on First Church? On uh, you're talking about the possibility of twenty additional yeah, thousand. Not, not currently. I will probably know by the, the next meeting. Is the 123,000 that we have left, is that unencumbered or does some of that have to go to certain projects or certain uh, historic or housing or <coughs> open space? It should be nearly all historic. That. So the, of the 220, uh, 217,000 comes in under historic mm -hmm. preservation, correct? So uh, 86,000 is reserved for historic projects, and, and the remainder is undesignated. Is undesignated. Okay, everybody got that? Mm -hmm. 86,000. So that doesn't really impact our decision making. 86,000. So in the past, what we've done, remember, is the shopping cart thing. We make motions uh, to put in the shopping cart. Those are not final. We Someone makes a motion, someone seconds it, we discuss it, uh, then we put it, we vote to put it in the shopping cart or not. And then we make a final decision after. Last time, remember, we voted as a package. Uh, we voted for the shopping cart at the end. And people didn't like that. They said, you know, we want to we want to rebring things out of the shopping cart in the final vote and vote them thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, so we're going to try that this time, right? Is that yes. self checkout? A self self checkout. And it's also in Probably. the initial funding discussion, sometimes rather than start with the shopping cart, people have just sort of said what they feel about some of the application. So the open right. So yeah. open. So we just open that up rather than and then move on to the shopping cart after. So, should we start that with a with a general discussion? Yeah, Chris. Um, first, I want to apologize for being late. We had a uh, I can't find not me. Someone in my family should find their cell phone. And, and cost, oh my God! It costs uh -huh. chaos. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> well, apparently, it's not just a phone anymore. It's a it's a it's a way of life. Yes. So. Um, well, yeah, we heard about it down here. Yeah. <laughs> we were looking. I was checking the drawer. So. Um, I missed the meeting where that where that came up, but I saw it in the minutes, and I I, I really I'm the, the the part about pulling teasing it out at the at the shopping cart thing. I, I really do find that preferential way to go about it. And so is that you, Linda? Thank you. Uh, um, so I just wanted to say that up front because I, I I did have to miss that meeting, and, and when I saw the minutes, I thought that that was really because there's been at least one occasion where I've, I've wanted to have another bite of the individual apple. Right. Uh, okay. So let's. So, so thank you for that. Yes. Thank you, Linda. Um, so rather than putting stuff in the shopping cart, let's go through and have general discussions. Um, do we want to start since it's uh, freshest in our mind with the conservation? Uh, I'm sorry, the historic preservation plan. Um, so let's go to that and simply open it up for discussion and having Martha in the house. Do we need a motion to start that? I don't think we do. No. We're not, there's, no, there's no motion to fund. We're simply discussing it. So I have a question. Mark, thank you for, um, that was really, that was really helpful. Um, I guess the thing I was most interested in was um, how would this proposal serve to give the community the tools to deal with this the, the demolition issue i was kind of shocked to hear the things that we've lost um knowing what we've got when you laid out the three parts i didn't see which one of those got us to the hey wait a second don't do that or wait a second maybe we ought to think about not doing that right so there there are a number of different uh preservation tools we call them in the preservation world um 
that could be explored. I'm not saying that they will make demolition go away, but you know, communities all over the country have dealt with this issue uh, in many different ways. You know, they've set up preservation trusts where the trust actually buys the building and oversees the renovation or puts an easement on it so it can't be, you know, torn down. Um, uh, so there are a number of different tools like that, and I think that you know the problem is we don't really have the expertise to assess what the right tool is for Northampton to use, or the right set of tools for Northampton to use. Um, I know Providence um, has a whole uh, you know program where they you know designate which buildings they think are the most important. In this this case, we're only dealing with buildings, obviously. And um, you know they put um, restrictions in place to save them. However, they can do that. And so, if that's something that the community feels really strongly about, and again, we don't really know. I mean, I feel really strongly about it. I want to scream every time one of these people shows up at you know one of our commission meetings with a, a new building that's going on a lot, where a building is coming down that's historic, like the Lathrop Home. Um, but I don't know if the rest of Northampton feels that way. Do they? Do you think? I don't know. You're asking, like, I, I, I don't know. I, mean, I can't imagine that anybody really cared what happened to the infirmary. Really? Yeah. Okay. And, and that, that's what I was wondering about, too. So you're asking that question because I think what you're believing is that they do care. What if they don't care and the people, and we, and we, we still need to have a group of people shepherding and taking care of this, and that's why we have this historic commission. Right, right. I think that, you yeah. know, so that, that's still yet another possibility that you do this whole plan and you find out now people don't care. They care about a form or something, or, you know, the programs okay. are different. They care that, that their health insurance costs are rising astronomically every year. I, you know, it, it, the reason I, I'm asking it that way is because you don't have a lot of money to, to split out. Is there a way to still get a plan without without engaging all of all of Northampton, without doing the all of Northampton engagement, so that could we get a plan for less than thirty thousand? Right, and so you know, one thing. Um, I'm just wondering in the possibility, in the possibility of sort of looking at you about, you, you probably don't even know, but you know, in the process of doing the Sustainable Northampton update, you know, are there pieces of it that could get folded into that process and then we could pull out the very historic preservation specific piece and, or require the consultant that's taking that on to, you know, add on a historic preservation piece yeah. to that. And without some additional funding source, I don't think the consultant could be requested to do anything additional. Mm -hmm. I think there are ways to frame it so that we could make the best use out of the public meeting that we will have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like the plan that was done 25 years ago, I don't think had any level of mm -hmm. public engagement whatsoever. It was mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. here are some tools, let's do these things, which isn't the best way to approach that. Mm -hmm. um, and sustainable Northampton will have to incorporate some level of consideration of historic preservation. Certainly not the level that would be included in a full preservation plan, but it, it's better than nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And we could use the consultant's time to do something else instead. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk about what that, because as far as I, in my experience, the connection between historic preservation and sustainability oftentimes is that historic buildings are exempted from, from you know, energy code requirements, things like that. Is there something, you know, is there something about window replacement, or what? what is the connection that we're envisioning would be addressed? Well, I guess it depends on how you define sustainability. I mean, it's only energy-based, that's one thing, but I think there's social response, there's social sustainability and economic sustainability, and, you know, the historic character of Northampton is a huge economic draw to this area. It's well, you know, I agree with that. Yeah. Those concepts, I'm saying, in a concrete way, like, what does paying a consultant to tell us that do for us in terms of getting us somewhere? I mean, I agree with that. I don't know. But, like, what is. I'm not quite sure I understand what having it in a thing that we call a plan does exactly. I'm not saying there's no answer to that. I'm just trying to. I'm, I'm no, throwing around really my own head to sort of figure yeah. out. I think everyone, every municipality in, in the state must be 
figuring it out because I think nobody can. I mean, the demo, the one year demolition delay is kind of what the state says you can do, right? That's, yeah, I mean, you can't and it really, really do doesn't. Much beyond that. I guess you, Amherst has a design review board, right? And I guess that's they one do way of dealing for certain with it. parts of the, yeah. And we do too. You know, the local historic district is basically goes under design review and the downtown business mm -hmm. uh, district goes under design review. But that's it. So, so part of my experience, we have, we have the Elm Street Historic District. There's this Pomeroy Terrace. That's the National that's Register District. Oh, okay. So it's well, basically well. an honorary designation. We only have one local historic we district. We don't treat it as a district. Did so, uh, so sorry. So anything that's in the Elm Street goes under review, mm -hmm. and then there's a list somewhere of other properties that are not in the district that go under review by default if anything happens. If, if anyone files a permit for those properties, no, there is no mm -hmm. list. Well, well the, uh, the only buildings would be ones that have easements on them, right? Preservation or easements. or unless complete demolition is proposed. Or mm -hmm. demolition. So which properties? Uh, so only anything in the Elm Street Historic District. Only anything in the district. Yeah. Or basically anything for which historic preservation is required, mostly by the CPA. Like uh, historic Northampton couldn't make exterior changes without the city's approval. So why are those other, what brings those other properties in front of the historic mission? The ones that I mentioned? Yeah. They're not all in the the answer to, They're yeah. not. None of them was in the answer. So I'm wondering if the demolition delay is any building older than I, I haven't looked at it. Older than 100 years or something has to come before you. I don't know. I'm it's right now. It's 1900, right? Yeah. Okay. And so anyone older than 1900 and or there there's a small selection of properties that are subject to historic commission review, but only for complete demolition. So anything before 1900 plus some other subset that's yeah, maybe somewhere. Maybe 50 buildings. That doesn't prevent exterior changes to those buildings, just complete demolition. Mm. Uh, Chris? You? No, I was just going to ask, did, yeah. on the Elm Street one, didn't they didn't they expand that to include the Round Hill yeah. Road area? So there were going to be two, but they just incorporated it in, into one big one? Right. Okay. You mean when it was first created? No, no, there was the Elm Street Corridor, which I'm in, and then about three or five years ago, they were trying to create a Round Hill Road one yeah. around the time that all the stuff was starting to happen up at Clark School. Right, that was the end of this Yeah. So what was the, what was the process for, for creating the boundaries? We expanded the, expanded the boundaries. Unilaterally, or did the property owners have, how, what's the there process? There was a process that we went through. It needs city council review. Um, it has to be approved by essentially all of the property owners within the district. Um, and then the, the state approves the boundaries as well. I don't know a lot of this is old hat, but sort of understanding the status quo is I think really important. To, I guess my, it seems to me that clear that there's some, there should be some kind of plan. <laughs> that seems like without a doubt it's yeah. obvious, um, at least to me. But, um, the cost thing is tricky to me because on the one hand, yeah, it'd be great to do something cheaper and partially in-house. On the other hand, I mean, a consultant won't have a meeting for I mean, $30,000. Even that, it's not that much, I, bet, I wouldn't think. Maybe not. That already seems pretty stripped down uh, for someone to do a decent job. And then I weigh that against, you know, Northampton is not Lennox. We're not... I feel, maybe this is my own, I don't know. No, I, I feel like Northampton should have, is a place that should have a forward thinking attitude towards uh, historic preservation. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of interesting things done in the past number of years about really opening up, liberalizing in a way, like how people think about what historic preservation is and mm -hmm. not saving everything necessarily. Yeah. You know? Really being kind of uh, radical in some ways. Um, like Max Page, I don't know if you've read his book, but it's, you know, some really interesting things that would be pretty controversial to people, and actually might create some public uh, public conversation. Um, so this is all. I mean, this is the kind of dialogue that we need as a commission. We need to have because we just don't right now. 
You know, we're basically responding to stuff that gets thrown in front of us, you know, meeting after meeting after right. meeting. And, um, you know, it feels like we should be directing more of the kinds of things mm -hmm. that this committee is looking at. You know, we should be encouraging applications from, you know, private individuals or, uh, you know, organizations or, or whatever. And we just, we're not. We're not up front of that at all. Mm -hmm. We're just kind of reacting, as Barbara said. Right. Multiple mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if that, just what you were talking about, David, if that were the, um, the vision that was established as part of this planning process, then that would give us a lot to work with. Right. So just to frame that, though, I think I worry that going forward with a you know, RFP that looks pretty similar to a lot of RFPs that the consultants have seen and, you know, you know, even narrowing down who are the consultants you'd want to put in the mix mm -hmm. of, you know, because they really run the gamut of, you know, right. doilies versus, you know, <laughs> black rim glasses or whatever you want to, you know. There's a lot out there, mm -hmm. and I think it takes a fair amount, and I don't know, like, what the, if there's unanimity on, on the commission even about what people are, you know, people might have really different ideas about what this, this process is going to be like. Mm -hmm. But I assume like that commission is going to basically manage the process. So that's a good point. There might be some people who really want to come up with some really, really great radical rethinking of how to get outreach and do all these things or linking all the property. There might be some people who are just like, oh, now we're going to save everything in Northampton. You know, like there might be just like differences on the commission now. I'm just concerned that how do you, is there any way to hash out some of that before someone gets hired? Sort of put that in the RFP. I think that these are really good observations. They're really good suggestions. You know, and maybe it's something the commission needs to go through the um, process of discussing this before we get to that point. That's, that's sort of exactly how I feel. It, it, it's it's as if um, this has come before us uh, before some of those difficult discussions discussions mm -hmm. have taken place. Yeah. Because I don't quite get what we're what the result what what we would get out of this or what you would get out of this and how helpful it would be. I mean part of it is I have to own my own knee jerk reaction to uh, consultants having worked in academia uh, most of my life and the nonprofits before that. I mean it's just you know a consultant would come and be like, oh holy shit. You know it's, a, <laughs> it's hours of my time we knew we would get nothing. And with you know this sort of this time um, suck when we had the expertise and yeah. you know they mm -hmm. construed into something it was like um, so I got moved beyond that knowing that <laughs> yeah yeah I mean it's just and thirty thousand is thirty thousand I'm not I, I just wonder if yeah. that there should be there should be discussion yeah, the other the other uh, oh sorry well as a consultant um, <laughs> whoops. No, I, I mean, I understand what you, it's like, it's like when you hear the word lobbyist, you automatically think of a fat cat, cigar smoking, cash dealing kind of guy. But anybody who works for, ad, does advocacy work is a lobbyist. So um, a consultant to me is a single task hire. So you're hired for a specific job, you come in, you do it, you're a non-staff employee of an organization for a specific task. That's what, that's my definition of a consultant. Um, so I don't have quite the same baggage that you do, um, and as, as a former lobbyist, I don't have the same baggage on that one. But I, I, Dave raises an interesting point, which is that if the Historic Commission is going to be steering the work of this, it may very well come with a slant on it, a, a predetermined slant, and, and I think that that is something that, um, as a community, we need to be watchful of, and I'm not sure that that the, the historic commission is that watchful eye. Um, having said that, I actually think that um, there's if if the only value added to bringing in an outside person to coordinate this kind of work is that they will coordinate this kind of work, that may be a, a good thing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm with you. I'm not sure what thirty thousand gets. I, I, I would, I would charge twice, <laughs> twice that. But, um, but I think that um, 
if that is what is required to focus the attention, I mean, it's almost like thinking about, we're gonna hire somebody half time for six months to do this project. And they're gonna come in and they're gonna go through all of what Northampton does and bring it together and just be the point person temporarily to get this thing done. I think there's a, there, there actually is a value to that. Even if it just, even if it focus all, focuses all of the able people in Northampton to spend their time, their time doing this one thing for, for a moment in time, rather than this is something I would love to spend time doing, but I'm not going to be able to get to it this week. Right, time is contingent on other people. Yeah, contribute. but but if they serve just a coordinating function, I, I see a real value to that once we decide what we want them to coordinate. And I, I don't know that that conversation has happened yet, so. Um, um, you know, well, just from what Chris said, it sounds like you need a facilitator <coughs> to mobilize the assets that you, you already have there, but apparently not being used. I'm, I was, I was shocked when you read that list of stuff that we've lost. Yeah in the last year or however far back that goes and, and um, I always remember this the uh, the house on King Street right next to the church that was destroyed that the Ruggle Center was was uh, very much involved in and I always wonder how in the world could that happen in, in Northampton without I didn't really know anything about it at the time I just make oh the, well surely they'll take care of that well they you know didn't but I also like your point about um, the other two areas that the CPC um, is primarily concerned with all, all already have their plans. And I hear you on that, and I think... You're preparing for consultants, by the way. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not anti-consultant. No, just um, kidding. Just joke. for the record, but... Um, I, I definitely think you need something. I'm kind of surprised. Um, I'm originally from the Midwest. Um, a lot of towns in the Midwest, they have no clue about historical preservation. Stuff gets just destroyed left and right. 50 years later, somebody, oh, you know, we should have done stuff like this. And I'm, I'm talking about a lot of small towns that I've experienced, um, similar to this, this size community, so. Um, I, I kind of feel like there's an urgency to do something, do something here. But I, I'm I'm listening to these concerns, and I think we I think we ought to do something. I, another part of your presentation, you, <clears throat> you said that there might there might be some point where some of the existing members of the of the historical commission could work with. So whoever this person or persons is that are that they come in, and I seem to be hearing that that could possibly defer some of the some of the cost. Possibly, yeah. I, it may, be, it may, yeah. Um. But then I hear like uh, for Chris is suggesting was like well, for perhaps for what's needed. That uh, that a consultant coming in and doing a really thorough job that thirty thousand isn't gonna wouldn't wouldn't satisfy what what you folks need so yeah but I'm I'm in favor of doing something I, I I'm uh, it's really that list really really made an impression on me I thought things were things were better. Than, than uh, I guess they are. We haven't seen nearly what they've seen in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. You've got a convert or place like that where they, you know, are trying yeah. to save historic resources because they're very important. And yeah, people come to the historical commission with their attorneys. Mm -hmm. Right, they fight. Mm -hmm. yeah, and from our perspective, there's not that much. I mean, it's pretty quiet here. I mean, and, yeah. and remember, all of those buildings that were demolished that are 100 years old. They might have demolished another hundred-year-old building a hundred years ago. They were oh, so, I mean, <laughs> something. You know, nothing lasts forever here, <laughs> especially you know, wood buildings. Sorry. Um, I, I have experience with consultants as well, and <laughs> um, they often bring their template. 
yeah, don't no don't look at you. Take your temp up and and so the point about really knowing what you want and controlling the consultant and having a vision of what you want, I think, is really important. And then you can. I mean, there are some consultants that have very valuable things to contribute, but you you, you can't cede to the consultant. Um, and this may be a very reductionist view or unimaginative view of what this plan could do, but what what I'm most concerned about is so what really are the tools? Are is there real? I mean, this is private property. What the, in this country, given private property rights, what the heck can you really do? And without having a strong understanding of what you can do, I'm not sure what the rest of your plan is. And that's sort of, to me, the foundation. Mm -hmm. Once you know what the possibilities are, um, then there can be decisions about how important it is to the community and so forth. But sort of approaching it from how important is, it, is preservation to the community as if this was really a real option. It's, it, we can't save because there's no money and there's no legal right to save most of this stuff. So what can you do? And then starting from that would really help focus what, what your other questions are, I think. But that means um, uh, the, the committee really thinking this through and shaping what is really going to be useful to them at the end of the day mm -hmm. out of this plan. Mm -hmm. And that would allow them to go to a consultant and really extract what you need to make this all useful. Because it, uh, otherwise, uh, to me, it's going to be inter very interesting information that amounts to no no real change in action because you haven't figured out what you can do and can't do and how to maximize what you need to. Right. Uh, 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 I think that's a really great point, and I keep going back to the document and looking at what what it call it, what it, the, the plan's objectives are. There are five objectives listed for developing this plan. I mean, one of them that I keep reading, I think, well, why why isn't that happening without the plan? Identify ways that existing historic preservation organizations can better work together and can involve a greater cross section of the working population. I don't really feel like we need to plan our consultant commission to work on that and, and it's a, a, a lovely objective but I don't also see how the plan gets us there so I, I, when I look at the five objectives was there a lot of conversation on the commission about the about these five objectives as being what people hoped there was not so you know that concerns me because there, and there was another one, but that one really sprung out of the identifying ways of how that could happen already. That, to some extent, is really the role of the commission already. Uh, although it's not exactly what it says the mission of the commission is. Um, and yet, I do love the idea of understanding what our assets are in the city. And I right. think the commission needs to know that. Right. Because, because I'm... I, you know, I, well, a few of us serve on other commissions in the in the city, and I I know that we I can tell you what the recreational assets are in the city, and I can tell you the status of our recreational assets, and we talk about them at meetings, and we think proactively, not reactively, unless someone you know burns down a playground or something, then we think mm -hmm. reactively. But otherwise, we're always thinking about what are the next recreational needs of this city, right, and how do we address that, and so. I think that's a difficult position to be in, to be on a commission that can't think, what are the next needs, as opposed to, how do we stop that demolition? And, you know, on the website, there's really two tasks that are identified as being that commission's tasks. One is the demolition review, and the other is taking care of our historic district. I think that's insufficient for a commission. But I'm nervous about the, us being, using, using this group to make better things happen on a commission. This is such a great conversation. So, um, do, is there anything? There's a way we can convey this. Yeah, I mean, it's 
it's hard because it's sort of ingrained institutionally. Like, well, we don't have the, the opportunity to think proactively, so this is what we do. You know, we're going to put on our late laser focus, and we're going to deal with the Elm Street Historic District and with demolition review. It doesn't mean that thinking proactively isn't important. It shouldn't be done. Mm -hmm. They just they don't have a mechanism to do it mm -hmm. currently. But I think the I think that what I'm hearing and it's it's this has been so useful to me um, and I hope you too, Sarah. That um, you know we need to have these conversations as a commission. And I guess you know maybe what I'm thinking is that if this is even possible to go back to them and say, look, you know, we need to go through this thought process and, um, you know, reapply or, um, I don't know, redefine it, I guess. Yeah, I'm here needing to reapply for more money, too. Not that we have more money, yeah. but, no, right? 30000 Well, the amount of money is not the consultant. No, that was just me being. The dollar amount no, know, itself doesn't concern me. We hire consultants, and the consultants hire, yeah. The 30000 came from where? That's kind of the going rate for these around the state. Mm. Well, yeah. So let me throw a couple other things in the mix. A couple of years ago, well, I mean, historic North Hampton spoke to us a number of times, but a couple of times, a couple of times ago, I guess it was the barn. Yeah. yeah. And I, I guess I, had, I, I, I would, I really wanted them to, you know, barn, great, save the barn. Why? Like, what? Just to like put old stuff in a barn. Okay. And. I really want them to come back and say, here's our like very proactive way that we want to aggressively market the history of Northampton to the people who come by here and make it an experience and, and 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 before we start spending money here and there. And then we're fine with the small grants, you know, they have these things they need to preserve and that's great. But I, I feel like especially in a place like Northampton where you really it is a place that attracts people who think differently about all kinds of things in the world. And I think History is a, is ripe for that kind of alternate type of thinking. Um, I would be surprised if if you were not greatly advantaged by writing this RFP in conjunction with Historic Northampton. They already have a huge amount of this information. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. You know, not that they would do this, but I think there's a huge task in terms of. I mean, it seems like within Northampton's boundaries, there is enough brain power and knowledge to make a list of here's the properties that matter. And going to a consultant and saying, here's the properties that matter. But then instead of just thinking about it as brick and wood that we want to save and paint or whatever, but I think the, the issue with the reason the Historic Commission doesn't act like the Recreation Committee is that historic resources, their significance is very, it's ethereal. It mm -hmm. depends who you are. It's yeah. hist whose history is it? You know, a lot of people say that's not my history. I don't care. Burn it down. Yeah. You know, yeah. it really is strange like that, and it's hard to pinpoint. Um, so I think the and, and and it's also there's a sort of um, self fulfilling prophecy aspect to it, where if nobody cares about the infirmary. Nothing happens there for 20 years, then truly it's not important anymore because nothing's happened there for 20 years, so whatever. But on the other hand, if people say, this is an important property, let's be proactive and have something happen there so that we as a, co as a community remember this place, then 20 years go by, it becomes more important, and then people would never want to get rid of it. So there's an aspect to it where starting with the list and then it's almost like editing it down, or you know, there's a, whole, there's a lot of ways to do it. but. I think you're, you're thinking that you want the commission to be less reactive and more proactive is exactly right. Mm -hmm. I would just push that further, that let's mm -hmm. really think, you know, if, if we say we don't care about the random houses that are in the neighborhoods because, you know, neighborhoods change, but there's 20 sites that are around town and we want to create some kind of activity to make them truly alive today. Because uh, that's the other thing is we talk a lot about the built environment, but it's really like the activity and the remembrance of the activity that's much harder to preserve, you know, and without becoming, you know, historic Williamsburg or something. Uh, Virginia, sorry. Well, no. I know. no. So I think that kind of process, which is probably like at the why a lot of people got into historic preservation in the first place, and then before they got bogged down by demolition agreements or whatever. But um, 
that should happen. And I, it seems like there's a really good people at historic Northampton who probably would be really excited about being part of this, I would think. I don't know, I'll speak for them, but I don't know what the nuts and bolts of how that process would work. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're definitely on you know, the same page. I think you know their mission is to um, preserve and restore and interpret their collection. That's really their, what they're there for. So they have this collection to maintain in these houses, and so much of their focus goes into that. But they, um, they, excuse me, for, they're so expanding now. They are. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah, and they're, they've actually come to the commission to talk to us yeah. about this. So they really seem to be moving beyond that narrow footprint yeah. into. Yeah. And we have to have coincidence that we have a thing called Historic Northampton, which is a place that you could go to be the center of all this. That. I mean, it seems like limiting the, you know, what I would call a charrette, you know, of what this probably, you know, brainstorming session to just the people on the historic commission seems like thinking way too small. Right. But mm -hmm. I don't know who the great crowd is, you know. And, and I'm, just, I'm just talking about writing the RFP. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. This is great. Okay. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, a couple of historians that wrote a book called uh, The Anarchist's Guide to Historic House Museums. Which sounds really boring. It's not at all. It's really pretty that amazing. Really good. <laughs> this guy, he does these things called one night stands, and he goes to these house museums like the Emily Dickinson, places like that, and he'll live in the house for a day or two and like blog his experiences. And it's really amazing. It gives you insights into historic properties. That anyway, they have these very strange ways of uh, looking at historic properties and really bringing them alive. Because a lot, of, you know, most people walk past these things every day and they're not there. To me, it's very exciting, but I think it just the legwork has to happen on the front end to make it really worth something worth doing. Because it's not going to happen again for 25 years, I think. Yeah. Well, this conversation was really um, useful. Just if it's just a conversation and it doesn't, doesn't go any further um, tonight, we'll take it all back to the commission and share it with them and see what they want to do about it. Okay, um, any other discussion on the preservation plan? Looking at 10. I guess I'd just like to summarize my comments, which is I would like to give them the help they need. I think they just need to define better what the help is that they need. Second. Do we want to move on to a formal uh, motion on this, or do we want to continue a general discussion in the time remaining to other proposals? It's 10 of Ten of nine for looking at nine o'clock. Is it go home? Would someone like to make a motion now, or should we? Should we? Uh, I'm appreciating this discussion, and I think I'd like to move on, and not necessarily tonight, but have discussion with the other okay. uh, major proposals too. Okay, so let's let's do that. Unless anyone has anything pertinent, more pertinent to say. I'm sure Martha will remember every word that was spoken. <laughs> Well, in a way, you don't have to remember every word because it seems like, you know, what I keep hearing and what I keep imagining is that that whatever happens with this, that what that the, what would be lovely is if the commission could could hold some kind of a large summit meeting of all of the groups in Northampton who have an interest in historical preservation or the individuals before then stepping into next phase of an RFP and what do we want and what would the plan look like? Okay. Okay, the time remaining since uh, Wayne was here, should we look at the uh, interpretive signage? Questions or comments about that? I appreciate that he's trying to negotiate somewhere between command and control and extreme democracy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that he'll do a good job with this. Chris, did he? Did yes, yes, he did. Thank you for asking. He was yes, satisfied. He did. With this. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, you know. He's going to be back. What's oh, yeah. Up? Yeah. Right, that's yeah. But but um, sure. but I but I, but but I I think I think he heard um, our support for in the future 
seeing this as part of the as part of the overall thing, which okay. which for me is the right way. I, I just don't like piecemeal approaches to these things where I don't see an, an end to it. Um, and for some reason, I'm comforted by the idea that there's going to be an institutionalization of how this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. so, yes, I'm good. Thank you. I have to say I was confused. This is kind of a separate topic, I guess. Maybe we can talk afterwards about the textual thing. I don't quite understand what was going on. But we can talk about yeah. that later. The agreement that they're coming up with. Right. I don't, don't yeah. think that it's going to be it's for not for no. And it sounds like it's going to come back and bang it out for us. So. <laughs> I, I can give you more details. Okay, we'll talk later. Later. Yeah. Anybody else want to weigh in on this side? Okay, I'll try to get through the academy. Hmm, I would actually appreciate hearing your thoughts on the academy. <laughs> and your knowledge of, I mean, the, the, the whole issue of historic preservation versus, what did he say? Oh, rehabilitation. Okay, so rehabilitation. rehabilitation and yeah. yeah. Let me explain a little bit about that. And how that settled out for the historic commission. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, he's like, bro. So historic preservation, um, the National Park Service actually has a definition of this. And there are uh, several approaches you can take to preservation. Um, so you mentioned one, which is rehabilitation, but uh, there are three others. There are four, actually. And so one of them is stabilization, where you actually take a building and stabilize what's there. Just um, you know, make it so it's not going to fall apart, but you don't rebuild anything. You don't modify anything. You just stabilize it. Reconstruction is to reconstruct something that's gone and bringing it back. So, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example bring of that. Bring back the infirmary. Bring back the infirmary, there you go. <laughs> you could reconstruct that bit, that completely. So, reconstruction, rehabilitation, uh, and I'm gonna lose my train of thought, stabilization. Um, there's a fourth one. Re anyway. Reconstruction. I said, yeah, so, the, so, so what he's saying here is he's rehabilitating. Restoration. Restoration. restoration, yes. He's rehabilitating, which means that they don't, um, he was a little loose with his, his uh, language, because they do, they do have evidence of what was actually, what the paint actually was. He talked about that, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and they can do paint, they can do paint analysis on that kind of thing and find out exactly what it was. What? I was just at the Emily Dickinson Museum today. They completely uh, re wallpapered Emily Dickinson's bedroom. It's lovely if you haven't seen it. Um, to the original wallpaper because they had a tiny piece this big that was completely faded, nowhere else in existence in the world, and some artists remade the whole thing from this little piece of faded, really dirty uh, piece of wallpaper that was under like five other layers of paint. So that certainly can be done. Um, but they're suggesting that it would be so expensive that what you really have to do is do more rehabilitation, which is to um, make modifications to the historic structure uh, that make it suitable for contemporary and future uses, basically. So um, it is really cost prohibitive sometimes to do pure restoration or pure reconstruction. And they're claiming that it is. So, for example, like the light fixtures, he said that you know they couldn't really do that. They had, I think, they had one or two or something, and they could prop, they could have those remade, but you would have to take them to a foundry and have a mold made, and it would be really. Expensive. So, what I'm trying to remember is what the definition is, Sarah, in the statute, and really what whether this this is sufficient under the statute for our funding. Oh, for CPA funding? Yes. Uh, it, it it doesn't strictly so it, it's not worded very well. It, yes, it, it's okay. Uh, as long as basically as long as the Secretary of the Interior Standards fit into this sort of not very well worded part of the CPA Act, then then it's okay. Uh, and if you're you can do other things like code improvements that don't fit into the Secretary right. Standards. Right. Accessibility. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is fine. Um, and the the standards just really quick definitions. So reconstruction is recreating vanished or non-surviving portions of a property for interpretive purposes. Uh, restoration depicts a property 
history at a particular period of time in its history while removing evidence of other periods. Um, preservation focuses on the maintenance and repair of existing historic materials and retention of a property's form as it has evolved over time. And rehabilitation acknowledges the need to alter or add to a historic property to meet continuing or changing uses. And this is rehabilitation. It's sort of defining it. Yeah. It's not really saying. any of those, but yeah. but he it's, used the word a, rehabilitation. He did. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a mix depending on what element, yeah. the which is acceptable. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, secretary of standards. I think it's really the appropriate thing to be doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just curious about the cost. Yeah, I'm not questioning that. I just wanted to make sure we were okay with our the funding with their sort of yeah. 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 approach to this. Yeah, it, you can. Well, now that we're on the outs with the uh, coalition, we can't ask that. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get, we'll get. <laughs> they, they wouldn't answer anyway. They would just say, well, if you have, if you have questions, you should ask them. I thought we paid enough things. for exactly one question. Is, <laughs> is, this, is this the they one? Is this <laughs> they owe us because we haven't asked any questions. Right. So we so still good thing to uh, so they define it differently. So their rehabilitation and restoration is making capital improvements or extraordinary repairs to make ac assets functional for their intended use. Yeah, so that, yeah, that I think it falls within that. Yeah. Other comments about the academy? I think they know they're not going anywhere and we're not going anywhere, so I think we should feel free to fund them partially right. to the degree that yeah. we feel they things have priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't I, I, I can't see fully funding this given the limited funds that we have. So their top priority was fifty four thousand. Yeah. yeah, this so yeah. they want to it sounds like they want to kind of finish the interior. Yeah. Yeah. Makes, that makes sense. Um, and so I think it makes sense to do that and then they can move on to the lobbies um, next. Which means they'll be back in the fall. Which means they'll be back. <laughs> Ironic, they put all the money into the stuff that you, you use with the lights off and the stuff that you see with the lights on and lobby you to do. I think this is a building that will never, they will eat money for the rest yeah. of its life. We heard, we, heard, heard, we heard that tonight. Yeah, we heard they've got That's just three quarters of a million dollars worth of projects in the offing, and that doesn't include opening the, the, the refreshment stand on the second floor. It's like, I don't know where you think it's going to come from. And they don't have an elevator in the building either, do they? No. So how do you have yeah. one? Yeah. You can have like, you can have one on both floors. But. Right. Why? As long as everything is successful, on, which yeah. it is. There's a, so I think it is now, but you have to put the food upstairs, and nothing's a problem. Right. But yeah. there's going to be food down. Yeah, they have to go. Yeah. yeah. Other comments about uh, the academy? You know, we could spend another few minutes to just talk about the uh, graveyard and then we'd be a lot of the way there for our next meeting. Mm -hmm. So should we do that? Yes. Negotiate another few minutes. So gravestone conservation. The only one we have. Comments? Um, I guess I'm very supportive of the whole notion of addressing the priority one gravestones, how much, but it, I'm trying to juggle the money and figure out how much, um, how much we can give them. Um, to me, they're the most time sensitive, potentially, though maybe another year or so won't, won't do that much, and won't lose that much in another, in another year. I wish you could comment on that, but probably you can. Um, and Sarah, the, the 50,000 grant request, that has nothing to do with an in-house or a, 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 our uh, funding or not funding does not impact that request, is that correct? Uh, it, it would likely. It would likely, yes. It, it would that. likely impact that, yeah. There's, I'm, so there's, there's potential city funds that may be able to be used as a match, but the bulk of the match would have to come from CPA. Like, so I'm not sure, sure how much how mass this work. Well, they did not. Yeah. They did not make that clear in my mind. If, if that's in fact true, I wish I had heard that. So it's what I heard was if you give us if you give us a hundred and we get the grant, you'll get fifty yeah. back. I did not hear you're leveraging fifty. Yeah. 
There, there isn't 50 on the table currently. There's an application that's being right. submitted for 50, and if it's received, then not all of the CPA funds will need need to be expended. Right. That to but me, that's to me, that's different than in order for us to get the 50, we need your help. I, it's not. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's true because of the way the MHC grant is set up. We may potentially be able to leverage other city professional care funds, but possibly not. I, it, it depends on, on what type of commitment Mass Historic is requiring. Thank you. So, so I'm still confused. So the, the grant that went in did not specify that there'd be any matching funds from the Yes, it's a it's a fifty fifty matching. It is a fifty fifty. Yes. Okay. So if they got the fifty thousand, we would have to come up with fifty thousand to get that fifty thousand. Yes, in, unless Mass Historic is comfortable using the city's perpetual care funds as a match, and I'm not sure that they would be able to do that. Other questions or comments about the gravestone? Sir, I'm. I guess I don't know that we asked this. I don't think we did. Is there a sort of priority one A and one B? I imagine if, if if we funded it partially, there's within priority one the most important things that they would do first, and then I don't think we would, you know. Oh, I don't know how the rest of you feel. I'm saying that well, we would be comfortable with them coming back for the rest of priority one later on or something. I would assume something like that would work. I guess we also didn't really talk too much about the schedule, or did we? Did I forget that? about when the work would happen. I don't think we I said they were ready to go to bid, but um, does that mean by the end of the summer? Yeah, it should be this construction season because yeah. all of the, the bid documents are essentially ready to go right. uh, once the funding is available. So the work should be able to be done this summer and fall. Right, I guess it gets complicated though if they bid out only half the work. Yeah, I mean, if if the hundred thousand is allocated, then all of these priority one gravestones can be included in the RFP. Right. Even if Mass Historic allows this perpetual care fund to be used as a match, um, we wouldn't be able to go out to bid for all of the uh, priority one gravestones this year unless the CPA award comes through, because that Mass Historic grant won't be announced until. So all it says is we're ready to go out to bid as soon as funding is available. So there's no timeline. Right. Other, other comments about the gravestones, knowing that uh, somebody's lips are sealed? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, so what do we want to do? Do we want to call the meeting now? Or. Um, and sit on these things, does that make sense? Yeah. And come back in two weeks? Like yeah, you'd like to do that? Yeah. Okay. So we'll try to not recreate this entire conversation. Come back in two weeks. Um, if there were a historic preservation plan, then we'd know how important these great. Exactly. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Or your time how long. So uh, moving on, other business not uh, foreseen when agenda was published. Does anyone have anything else? I had one quick item. It, it annoys me to no end that the friggin' Calvin Coolidge clock is always wrong. And we put a lot of money into that thing yeah, yeah, to have a clock that me. never works. Well, I, can, I can tell you why. Oh. So <laughs> there's a part inside that's sheared off. Uh, so we have removed the part and sent it back to the, the guy who did the clock restoration. And he's making us a few new ones. Okay. So it, it's not it's, it's not like it, there's something it like well we just not can't find it. it. <laughs> like it's, there's there was a fatal error in the clock that is uh, currently okay. being okay. And that will theoretically solve this problem. Yes. And the winder is still winding and well it can't be wound now because But is it kit winding? Yes, it's the same person who winds the uh, church clock in Williamsburg. So he's an experienced. Even this is supposed to be wound? Yeah. 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 Wow. Is it weeks or less? Uh, yeah, about a week. Can you change your and it's like a uh, it's like a child labor thing. It's like a five year old or something. Huh? <laughs> 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 Seventeen. Seventeen. Five. Seven. <laughs> we go to college. Are we yeah, we don't I, well, <laughs> I find another willing. That's the historic commission. That can, 
<laughs> there's, there's like an art to it. You can't overwind it or underwind it. You have to know exactly how much to wind it or else it goes nuts. Yeah. It's just wow, it goes so bad. Uh, just fine. So finding out there's a reason again. Can we digitize and get over it? Uh, okay, moving right along. Is there a motion to return? Yes, so moved. All right.